Welcome, everybody. Look, we're not on the floor of the house. Uh, we're we are. Um, we are picking up with S23, which is the Senate version of the minimum wage bill. And we have with us today Commissioner Curley and Matt Barowitz from the Department of Labor. And again, um, committee, I apologize due to the time constraints that we've had. We haven't been able to be particularly linear in the testimony that we've taken so far on this bill. Um, but we will be able to start picking up on that next week and, and be able to go through quite a few uh, witnesses. But we wanted to get the Department of Labor in. Um, we noticed that you testified in the Senate. And if you could um, share your testimony, there are different, different, whatever you'd like to testify to on the S on S23 um, and how it's how it works with you. And then we'll have some questions. Great. For the record, I'm Lindsay Curley, Commissioner of Labor, and I have with me. Good afternoon. I'm Matt Barrett, Economic and Labor Market Information Chief for the Vermont Department of Labor. Thank you for having us. So I'm sure it will come as no surprise to those of you that were in the committee last year, a year ago, that our the administration's position on this has not changed, but there are new members, so we really do appreciate an opportunity to offer our perspective on this. Um, you know, I'm sure we can all agree that the intent of the minimum wage proposal, you know, helping Vermonters become self-sufficient and reduce dependency on state programs is a, is a goal we can all get, get our arms wrapped around or our head wrapped around, I should say. Um, but the Vermont Department of Labor does question the efficacy of the minimum wage towards alleviating the financial stress of Vermont households. Well, much of the minimum wage discussion has been on what will happen if Vermont raises the minimum wage to $15 an hour, there does not appear to be any clear evidence as to what has happened since um, or as a result of the previous four legislatively mandated um, minimum wage increases, which we are now at $10.78 an hour. Um, what we would argue needs to be better understood are the outcomes for all the reasons that the minimum wage was incrementally set four years ago how much additional tax revenue has been collected on wages, how much savings has state government programs incurred as a result of past increases, ultimately has annual income increased for minimum wage earners. So there's no evidence that we can point to, the Vermont Department of Labor can point to, that suggests that the previous mandated increase have moved the needle. The ability of minimum wage to impact wage inequality from <coughs> poverty statistics is suspect as evidenced by state outcomes across the country. Some states with high minimum wages have um, high inequality, and some states with low minimum wages have low levels of poverty. And the record here in Vermont is spotty. Vermont's own recent history with poverty is indication that the impacts of the minimum wage are not fully understood. Another example of this is that the traditional economic theory would expect labor force partition, participation rates to rise um, with the increase of minimum wage. But we've had an increase in minimum wage over the last four years, and we've not seen the labor participation rates increase. So um, in fact, labor force petition participation rates for young and prime working age adults, the very individuals who might benefit from a minimum wage increase of this magnitude, have been declining or held flat at best. So these are some of the reasons that the Vermont Department of Labor is asking for a pause in terms of um, further arbitrary increases to the minimum wage. The US economy has been on a historically long period of ec economic expansion, and the expansion cannot go on forever, though we all wish it would. By waiting to adjust the minimum wage beyond the statutorily set annual adjustment for in inflation, businesses would have more flexibility in adjusting to a future economic downturn. Um, 1968 is held out as the benchmark for minimum wage, but um, as a reminder, it was in late 1968 into 1969 that the U.S. fell into a recession. So it's time to think about the next national recession, although I'm not one to be an alarmist, but the reality is it's, it's very likely on the horizon. The department is both an employer focus and a labor supply focus. So while job losses are a potential concern, the data indicates a bigger concern in reduction of hours. 
an increase in hourly rate of pay does not increase in um, does not guarantee an increase in the annual earnings that uh, that a worker would take home. As reported by private employers in Vermont in 2016, the number of hours worked per week is down by 2.9 percent since 2008. In total, employers reported hourly earnings growth over the past 10 years ne nearly equal the rate of inflation. However, if hourly earnings are converted to weekly earnings, one sees weekly earnings are not keeping up with inflation due to the reduced hours. And it's reasonable to assume that the reduction in hours was not felt equally by workers, but disproportionately felt by those with the lowest skills. The part-time trend is echoed in the stubbornly high U6, which includes individuals who want full-time work but can only find part-time work for economic reasons. That level, which is more than two times greater than traditional unemployment rate, or the U3, the one that you often see um, and read about. Typically, after a long period of economic expansion, we would expect the ratio of the U6 to the U3 to be well below two, and it is not. In addition, um, in addition, the population of long-term unemployed is rising, um, indicating there's a population of Vermonters that are unable to gain economic traction. And increasing the minimum wage will actually make their challenge, likely make their cha uh, challenge of finding employment even greater, even more challenging. The committee is correct that wage gains have been captured by the individuals experiencing the highest growth of productivity in productivity. It's the department's position that there must be a better public policy option to address than the minimum wage. For one reason, about 50% of Vermonters under the federal poverty level have no earnings at all. Households with no one earning, no one earning age, um, no one earning wage income, thank you, increases the risk of generational poverty as um, proper work ethics are not passed on. There's significant money to be made right now in Vermont for workers with skills. The department is advocating for increasing the focus on skill acquisition to better prepare Vermonters to profit in the challenging marketplace instead of interfering with the mar marketplace and how the wages are set. Um, in this future labor market, only employees with the best skills will be able to compete. So again, we're, we're asking you to, to push pause on an arbitrarily increased minimum wage and um, consider you know, allowing some time or other policy maybe, but again, the Department of Labor can offer up that we um, have the ability to help uh, upskill folks at this point in time, hopefully getting them ready, you know, for what may be right on the horizon. Um, with that, I, I'm open to questions, but I also just want to make sure you know that Matt Barrowitz is here. He's our chief economist. Um, he's able to dive deeper into this conversation than I am. I'm an accountant, he's an economist. Um, but yeah, we love it. jokes about economists and that <laughs> <good>. actually. <laughs> we can go there if it gets challenging in here. <laughs> So, thank you for that, and that's, um, I actually think Representative Walls and I were the only ones who, who were here from the last um, biennium today. Um, first question, while I disagree with your take on the differences between, on, on the effect of minimum wage, um, you know, we'll respect that. Um, but how do you correlate the fact that we have a minimum wage that's um, that says 1078 or 1079 an hour? But we also have, through Joint Fiscal Office, Vermont has a state policy that determines what a livable wage is at the, for basic needs, which is still um, two and a half dollars over what the minimum wage is. Um, so the state policy already says that that people who are making minimum wage are already not going to have a livable wage in, in Vermont. How do you, how do you, how, how do you match those things up? Do you want to take the first stab or you want me to? <laughs> uh, uh, all right. I, um, I mean, first of all, I would tell you that supply and demand is forcing employers to pay higher. So um, the folks that do possess the skills are likely making more than that to begin with, like this is a time where they can um, gain higher pay as well as, you know, throwing benefits in there. Um, I, uh, let, me just, let me just gather my thoughts here. 
Yeah, you want me to jump yeah, in while you're yeah, going? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I see there's two ways. One, there's um, uh, this is a challenging conversation, first and foremost, for me as an economist, because I'm here as an economist to provide information to help people make a decision. I'm not here as an individual or a voter or a person with personal preferences. I'm not here to talk about social issues or um, other things. So as an economist, when we're looking at this, um, you are right to point out that the basic needs budget is about that. And so there's, there's two things I see uh, when it comes to that. One, as it relates to an employer when they're determining when to hire, when to fire, and how much to pay, they have to ensure that it is actually going to be net positive to bring on that worker. And there are skills that need to be acquired in the marketplace to help people grow and understand their roles and responsibility within an individual organization. These could be hard skills, they could be soft skills. So that's kind of an aside. Putting that together with what we're really talking about, and this is where I, the dismal science in me gets a lot of eye rolls, because what we're talking about is prices. How much is someone willing to sell their time for? We're talking about the price of labor. So when we're lining up the price of labor relative to the price of goods and services across the economy, you move one price, the other price is going to respond. So, you will, so my fear is, is that by changing the wage rate, if your goal is that we're going to set it to the basic needs budget, the basic needs budget will, will shoot up a year from then. You're always going to be playing catch up, and you will never reach that threshold. Representative Tran. So, uh, you spoke of skills acquisition. So it, my thought is that if we are, so as a state, we've been looking toward um, uh, vocational and technical education to fill jobs that are, are, are not being filled presently. Um, and it seems to me that um, skills acquisition is, if we expect that to, to satisfy that to some degree, but why is not is a fifteen dollar an hour wage not the incentive that is going to carry that mission through? That's a great question, um, and I, there's two things I think about in this. Uh, again, two things. Um, so one, the. Traditional economic theory says you raise the price of something, then the supply of it will increase, right? And so, um, so if jeans became three hundred dollars a pair, more people would want to produ produce and supply jeans. Labor, we're finding, does not respond in that way because, as the commissioner mentioned in her op opening statements, as prices for way the minimum wage have increased, we have not seen a corresponding increase in labor force participation, which indicates there's something in the market that's making it to those individuals' disadvantage to seek additional opportunity or take the initiative to learn those additional skills. I think conversations related to benefit cliffs are in, generation of poverty, barriers to employment that are as long as our, uh, at least as long as our arm. And these are, again, the people we work with and serve at the Department of Labor, we help anyone who walks in the door, whether you have a PhD or you haven't completed high school. And so we are trying to get people on a sustainable path that they can grab hold of those first rungs of the career ladder. And the fear, I think, coming from the administration, again, I don't have a public policy opinion on this, I'm trying to provide information, is that you, in some ways, can be sawing off the lowest rungs of the employment ladder, making it more difficult for people to grab that first rung because you're going to be competing with automation, you're going to be competing with uh, business uh, preferences and changes in actually the way they do business and provide services. So back in the, the uh, companies used to be more integrated. There used to be that old story, like you could start in the mail room and work your way up. You right. know, there's even, yeah. I think, a Broadway play based on it, right? Yeah. The mail room is no longer part of that organization because of specialization. So now, actually, they're hiring out the mail crew. They're hiring out the janitor staff. They're hiring out the landscaping crew because it, there's an economic incentive to do so for those businesses to increase their bottom line. And so there, this is where you, you take a bigger step back and say, other than just tinkering with prices, because prices will react and the marketplace will respond to price changes, we need to think more broadly about how businesses are uh, providing incentives to do, or not incentives, I'm not promoting incentives, what are their incentives and disincentives when they're making business decisions? And that is a much broader discussion involving taxes and corporate structure. Have you tried to hire a plumber lately? <laughs> What's the wait time? <laughs> right. What's so that's, the what wait time? that's what I'm saying. I tried to get an I'm appointment. Not, they said I'll see you in six weeks. I'm not seeing the mm -hmm. sawing off the bottom rung. What I'm seeing is $15 an hour to learn a work ethic, to uh, apply your trades in the workplace. Being paid better is an incentive to do that. Right. 
And in those situations, like a plumber, like an electrician, you come in in an apprentice wage, right? Yeah. You learn yeah. the trade, yeah. and then you become self-sufficient yeah. as your own. And what there's a fear is that, you know, based on the populations we're working with right now, we have people that, to the bottom line, it doesn't make sense for an employer to bring them on because of the liabilities of, like, their business reputation. I can't count on them to open the store if they said they were going to open the store. So basically, we're working with individuals who aren't employable at $10 an hour. So how, what are we going to do for those individuals? So it's not, so sure, when we change the price of wages, there will be people better off. Many of those individuals have skills. And I've been in the uncomfortable situation where I've talked all about economic theory, and then I've sat and watched the next person come in, and they're bringing, they're a real person talking about putting real food on the table, right? And they talk about difficult situations in which they had to work two or three jobs until they got a break. But those breaks are because of the roles and responsibilities they accepted in those other jobs that put them in that next opportunity. Okay, before I let, um, before I sort of represent Byron and represent Palaki, but you use the phrase labor force participation several times. Um, I understand that a 2.5% employment rate is dangerously low, but that seems to me that a labor force participation would then be really high. And I know there's other numbers that can measure different levels of unemployment. But can you define, it, it, can you, it just, just jangles a little bit to say that with a 2.5% employment rate, unemployment rate, that we don't have labor force participation. Can you just explicate that a little bit, please? Sure. So when we, uh, the, my Federal Partners Bureau of Labor Statistics, in partnership with the U.S. Census Bureau, conduct a monthly survey where we ask uh, Vermonters for my households. That's how the unemployment rate is defined, is by actually questionnaire to Vermont households. I just actually answered a question from a, uh, a citizen of Vermont who uh, was asking about, well, what about all the people who've run out of UI benefits? You know, they're not counting the unemployment rate, and I had to explain that's actually two separate things. You can be unemployed and not receive unemployment benefits. They're actually two separate worlds, because really what we're talking about is the labor force. So this survey simply asks, are you working? If yes, then you're definitely in the labor force and you're working. If no, you're not working, the questions become, are you looking for work? Are you willing to accept work if offered? Are you able to perform work if offered? So to be in the labor force, you either have to be employed or unemployed. And to be unemployed, you have to be willing and able to accept work if offered, and you've actively looked for the work in the last month. So there's a big cohort of people um, of, uh, within the civilian institutionalized population in the state of Vermont, that's the population we study, civi civilian non-institutionalized population, meaning they're not in the military and they're not in um, some sort of, uh, you know, we have these really awful terms, uh, what a non-institutionalized facility, um, either medical perhaps or, you know, but anyway. So our labor force participation rate relative, relative to the nation is a little bit higher. We're about 67, 68% relative to the nation, about 64, 65. So that's basically saying of everybody who is 16 plus, who's non-military and not institutionalized, a uh, term I'm not comfortable with, but that's the opposite of non-institutionalized, um, we're about two thirds of the people are saying either looking for work or I want work and can accept work. So that's the 2.5% the is actually just the labor force. So if you are looking for work, want work, can accept work, 97.5% of them are able to find work, and the 2.5 can't. So that's one core of people. But there's a whole core of people that aren't in that calculation because they say, I can't accept work right now if offered. Maybe I'm taking care of a sick loved one. Um, uh, I, I haven't looked for work in a year. Um, but there's maybe they have barriers to employment or something. Or maybe for economic reasons they don't need to work in yep. their mind. They, yep. right, then. Yeah, they could be in school. Yeah. It's not necessarily a negative thing that someone's out of the labor force. There could be positive things that are going on. But so there is people outside the labor force that are not considered employed or unemployed. Um, and a lot of people find that discussion interesting because if you could pull more of those individuals into the labor force, they would be they would help for a lot of the labor shortage that you see around the state. Represent by Ron. Um, I think I got a two-part question for you. Um, what percent of jobs currently in Vermont are minimum wage, and how has that fluctuated in like the last ten years? Has it contracted, expanded? That's a great question, and um, I've seen data for Vermont that others have provided from my seat at the Department of Labor. I don't have that information. Okay. Uh, we do not uh, collect data that is sufficient to uh, answer that question. Um, 
and so that there's no way of trying to mine that at all, or you, you just don't have the the the, the necessary you don't have the necessary information right. to like actually calculate. So that yeah, especially if you're talking about people or individuals. Um, so we did provide uh, the underlying data set that Tom Kovett used in his. Uh, modeling mm -hmm. and that looks at jobs and so we can see how many jobs fall where they fall and so those estimates would be based on Department of Labor data about how many people like so if you're looking at Tom Kovett's study saying basically in 2020 26,770 are the approximate number of jobs that are less than the proposed minimum wage rate so he's taken our occupational data and okay so you can provided. kind of round off a percentage yeah. from that so yeah so you can see like 30, if, according to his data, saying about 30,000, and yep. about 30, if you just even round it down to 300,000, so it's like one out of 10, yes. Okay, so ballparkish, call it 10, 12% of the workforce is minimum wage. I think that's, it could be true. Could be. As, yeah. as a snapshot, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of that data, we experienced a lot of challenges with it. And I think there, this question came up last time I was in here when I was doing my introduction is because, so this is occupational based data that employers are providing to us about the outcomes of their employees. If you are someone who is a carpenter and, or a plumber, your boss can say, I pay them 18.73 an hour, point. You know, exclamation point, fact. If you are in the leisure and hospitality industry, um, you are providing either an estimate of what the tips are, because the tips are supposed to be included, mm -hmm. or you're just saying, I just pay them $5 an hour because that's what I'm supposed to pay them, and then we have to call them and says, it says you pay them $5 an hour, and the minimum wage, you know, including tips, is supposed to be at least ten seventy eight. Well, yeah, whatever it is, just mm -hmm. mark, mark me down for that. So we know that that occupational data typically underreports the economic outcomes of individuals who receive a significant amount of their earnings from tips mm -hmm. because we talk to those employers. And they say, I can't estimate that. You can either have the data or not have the data. We don't care. And so we're like, well, thank you for answering my phone call. Gotcha. There we go. Kalaki and then so. Two questions for the commissioners are, what you mentioned about there are states that have um, not as a low minimum wage, but there's a not a big disparity between wealth, and then there's the states that have high minimum wage that have a high disparity between wealth. I, 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 can, can you just send us examples so I, I begin sure. to understand this? Yeah, sure. Because I, I want to see that. Did I answer that? Yeah, yeah. You know what sorry. I mean? Yeah, so you kind of want to know can we point to some of those specific states that we're anecdotally kind yes. of referring to? Okay, yeah. And then the second thing is. Um, you know, I know all in the 10 years I've lived here, all governors wanted young people to move here, but it seems younger people are moving away. So when you're, your issue, you said if you look at young people and they, there's not been an increase in jobs for young people, but isn't that with the minimum wage issue? If we factor in the exodus of youth, how does that, is that factored in to what you were talking about? Do you know where I'm eating your testimony? Thank you. I'm not sure. Labor force participation oh, okay. rate young oh, people. Oh, young people. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I will just share with you that I have not necessarily seen data to prove that our young people are leaving okay. the state. Okay. And so I hear this often. Like people will say, our young people, they don't want to be here because they don't think there are jobs and things. So I just want to clarify to you that I think part of the issue that's happening is like there's a population that doesn't necessarily maybe want to engage, you know, in the workforce. So I wouldn't I wouldn't argue that they've left our state. I just want to sort of be clear that I, I'm trying to sort of walk around this. I mean, there might be, again, barriers, like maybe there's um, addiction, maybe there's, um, you know, other, like I said, other barriers for it. But I just, I'm not sure young people are leaving. Okay, so but we are aging, I will, right? So we're but, less but, young people. But what you're, you're saying is that it's, Younger people, there's less participation in the workforce there is. over the last 10 years. Yep, and Matt might be able to speak a little bit to that too. Yeah, and as of the labor force participation rate conversation, it's not necessarily that uh, all of them are quote unquote uh, doing nothing. There's a Wall Street Journal article about the do nothing generation that was kind of debunked. Um, we're trying to look into this population now referred to as need not employed or in education and training. Um, and so we're going to try and build out some data for the state of Vermont, but it's very difficult with our population and sample size, but there is some good data at the national level on the NEET population and the EET. Um, but this labor force participation rate, some of them could be um, 
uh, in post-secondary education or career technical education, because when they dug into the data, there used to be kind of, if you could hold four categories possible, if you're a young person, you, you exit school and you go to work. You exit school, you go to more school. You exit school, you do nothing. Or you exit school and you go to work and go to school. The population that has changed the most is the population that has exited school, gone on to school, and gone to work at the same time. So it's like there, it's now an either or. Either I go to work, I go to school, or I do nothing, as opposed to that cohort that used to be quite significant. I go to school and I work, which was common. Well, that's kind of how I did it. So it was common for a lot of people I knew. You work and go to school. How long is this trend of going on in Vermont? Um, we're still looking for the Vermont level data because all this is a national study. Um, but this is a study that kind of came out in like the 2015s, 2016s after the recovery happened in 2009. When the economy started growing, we started seeing tight labor market conditions and the conversation about where all the young people started in the nation. Um, you know, because we do have a low birth rate in, in Vermont, particularly we have a low birth rate, but even the U.S. has a low birth rate. So as a result, uh, it's particularly here in Vermont, of a 20 or 30 year low birth rate, you know, it, when you look out the window, you don't see as many young people as you used to, and that's a, a reality, but a function of it is because of uh, birth rate more so than they're all leaving. We don't see any difference in the immigration, out migration patterns of youth relative to the past. Thank you. Representative Saad, and then Kamash. I, I hope this question isn't too abstract, but <laughs> I. Um, I'm curious if the administration's position is in agreement to some degree that the market is not allocating resources in the way that we'd like to see it. Is the market failing to allocate resources? Are there people who, if we agree that wages are not matching expenses, in my view, that's a market failure. But in the language that I heard you use, at one point I heard you reference work ethic, and then I heard, again, multiple references to workers not having the skills that they need. Um, that sounds like you maybe believe in the market mechanism, but you're saying that the work, the workers who are participating in it are lacking in some way. They're either lacking the skills or the work ethic. That's what it sounded like you were saying, and I'm just trying to get it clear whether that was what you were saying. I don't think it's any one thing, to be honest with you. I think that there are folks maybe that um, maybe do lack the drive or the work ethic. That being said, I also think that, again, when you have such a small pool of people to choose from to fill vacant jobs, they might be skilled in one area, not meeting, you know, again, we talked about plumbers, right? We have a real lack of plumbers. So um, I, I think it's, it's a, a very broad issue. I don't think it's any one thing, and I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I don't want to leave you thinking that I'm saying that Vermonters you know, generally lack the skill or lack the desire, but I, I think you have a whole host of different things that are, that are creating a challenge for filling the job vacancies that we do have, and also for the people who are not maybe able to, to have that livable wage. You know, they're, they're, maybe they either don't have this, the skills that are needed for what is open, or they lack the desire, maybe they lack the education, lots of different things. But there's a basic agreement then, I guess, that um, that workers who work full time should be able to pay for the costs associated with living in Vermont, ultimately, without the intervention of state agencies, without the intervention of charities, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a basic agreement that a person who works full time should be compensated in such a way that they're not relying on other state agencies to meet some gap? I mean, I, yeah, in a, that would be ideal. Again, you know, are they showing up? Are they, are they bringing to the table what they're supposed to bring? I, I can give you an example of a, um, I am a small business owner, so part of the business, but an example of a, a young woman who worked for us who was very, very bright and talented, and we kept trying to push her up, push her up, push her up. And she said to us, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you to pause right now because I can't take that because I will lose these benefits. So again, I think it's a real broad conversation about, um, I think employers are happy to, to pay more, especially right now. They're gonna pay more than minimum wage. If somebody is really good and they're, they're showing up and they're doing their job and they're willing to gain the skills, but you have to remember that the, the worker has to wanna row in that same direction. And if there's 
different policy handles that are that are affecting their decisions that an employer can't necessarily control just by raising, you know, paying more to that person. I, 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 I absolutely agree with you that somebody that's working full time and is, you know, giving their best effort should be able to pay the bills. Absolutely, but I think it's a much broader conversation. Representative Gamash, that's right. So, talking about whether or not young people are leaving the state, um, I'm wondering, we do have uh, information on the numbers of students going through school, graduating to the high school level. Um, so, I'm wondering if there's a way of being able to determine, let's say, people that 25, 25 year olds or older, if they, in reflective of the school population, if there's a correlation between the people who are here working at that age in, in relation to the people, numbers of people that have gone through school. <coughs> Because sure uh, I'm not including, I'm not including post high school in that because people leave the state. There's all sorts of transitions. So we're talking about people who uh, either from high school have gone into the workforce, uh -huh. or there's been um, a lapse in terms of full-time work uh, for a measure of time, and that may very well be to going to some sort of post-secondary schooling. Um, Presumably, once that schooling is completed, or that training, or skill building, presumably those people, if they're not here while that's happening, will return here. Um, people are saying, no, they're not returning here. Not or returning. not in, in large enough numbers, mm -hmm. and therefore we're, we're, we're feeling that deficiency. And nobody seems to be able to, you know, anecdotally, you know, the business community, I mean, people in business and such can reflect on that, and we hear that being coming from different sources. Sorry, it's my chair. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately we don't have like a longitudinal database to say like, oh, look, these are the cohort of individuals who graduated 10 years ago and where are they now or how many of them are here. We certainly look at, could look at populations and say, yes, in 2005 we graduated 100,000 students and now theoretically they're going to be 28 now so we should, um, you know, we can see how many 28 year olds we have. Right. We have that, but again, they're going to be all, they're not connected in any way so they could be totally different populations, you know. 100% of those 18 year olds go left and the, the, all the 28 year olds might be from out of state, right? But in that sense, we would be, well, we wouldn't be retaining our young people, but we would get, be gathering young people from other places. So yeah. it, I'm and talking I, about the end result, which are yeah. the in numbers. Right, in and I think that the last, the typically Vermont, and I thought that I, this held up in the last time they looked at uh, tax data, the in and out migration of tax filers, that uh, Vermont is still like a net, net importer of like 30 somethings. Yeah, and I think I think the idea that, that, that there are less youth, I mean, that's clear in education numbers. That's mm -hmm. also region-wide. I mean, I graduated from a high school that had 750 people 40 years ago, and last year they graduated 450. So that's in a denser, more populated place than Vermont. So I think the idea that minimum wage has anything to do with in or out migration is, is you know, it, it's not going to matter one way or another, but it does matter. In it, it matters in different ways. Um, Representative Tryon. Um, and then Hango. Uh, oh, so <laughs> um, do we have enough and, or any data that uh, from states or regions that have gone to $15 minimum wage to suggest how they and what impact on the economy? I mean, I think it's Washington, some sections in New York State has been growing over the last few years. I wonder if there's any data that you've collected that would indicate what impact on the economy that. Yeah, I have not personally, but you know, I was looking over Joyce Manchester's testimony from the other day, who she does summarize some of the outcomes related to some of the more research. Um, I think that you know, the Seattle study. I, I don't want to speak to her testimony because I'm not sure what context sure. it was put in, um, but there were some interesting findings that. Um, 
uh, the authors found some evidence of reduced employment in tradable sectors. So I assume that means like the retail trade, wholesale trade industries. Um, that the that this one said this was the following employment data of individual working in the state of Washington. They followed workers in low wage jobs immediately before Seattle's minimum wage increase. And on net, there was an increase of nine dollars and forty seven cents to as much as thirteen dollars per hour raised in earnings on an average. So their their sorry their wage ran from about say ten dollars to thirteen dollars, and it was concluded that they raised their earnings by an average of each twelve dollars per week. So even though they got a significant increase in their hourly earnings, the, the overall on the weekly basis, they only saw an increase of age twelve dollars in their paycheck. Um, and then the entirety of the gains accrued to those workers were for above median experience baseline. So the, the individuals who already had skill sets were the ones actually realized it, and the people with the less uh, experienced workers saw no significant change in their pay. And that goes again to kind of the point that I didn't get a chance to uh, respond to your question of like, is this the right tool? Because even if you're theoretically, we all agree that if you work a full-time job um, at a wage rate, you should be able to take care of your own basic needs. Will changing the minimum wage actually then lead to that end result, or is there need to be some other action? Because um, you know, they, they were the third point in there was an increased retention, and that's a significant thing. Yes, and I, I, I am interested to see how that plays out because um, typically the, the retention conversation gets wrapped around either the efficiency, the efficiency wage theory, um, but. My perspective on the way individuals behave is when you're at the minimum wage, you know you're at a minimum wage job and you can find a minimum wage job anywhere. And so the retention, um, I'm interested to see if that will hold up over a business cycle. Because right now we're talking about the economic outcomes of areas in the country that are prospering significantly during a period of economic expansion. We've been growing since 2009. We're talking about 10 years of economic growth. What happens during an economic downturn? Will these uh, benefits still manifest? Will they still be realized? Um, so yeah, it's a good question. I just don't, I don't know all the literature on this. How about, do we have any information as to how that $9 an hour possibly filters back into the economy? Or, or $9 a week. Or $9 a week, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 I was like, what you were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, are, are retail businesses doing better? Are lumber yards doing better? I mean, do we have any information that would suggest that? Well, this is where we roll back up and I just have to wear the skunk hat at the picnic because like, <laughs> even going right to the bottom line of Tom Cadet's recent analysis, it shows that the effect on the level of GDP in Vermont is negative. And so to everybody's uh, like the, to a lot of people's thinking, those are just unreconcilable. How is it that we're going to give all these people a wage increase, and the overall impact to our economy is going to be negative? Right? And as a as an economist, this is for me. It's just like uh, this is all I have done for the last twenty years is think about the economic outcomes of things, and this goes back right to the tenets of economics, which is you can either focus on efficiency or equity, but you can't tackle both at the same time. So you are specifically addressing the equity question at the sacrifice of the efficiency. And these are, again, sometimes thought of as callous terms outside of economic circles, but what it is is you're picking winners and losers. And some people may be better off, but there will, without doubt, be others that will be worse off and potentially permanently separated from the labor force, which as uh, you know, someone who works with the Department of Labor, works with our career resource centers, that is the biggest question and concern we have is the people that are gonna be permanently separated from the labor force because they can't compete in the current labor market at the prices being set. So um, you know, as a thought exercise, I always think about what happens if minimum wage was completely removed because sometimes that's always the counterpoint to me is are you saying uh, you don't want any minimum wage? And I said, well, I'm not saying anything. You know, I don't have opinions, I'm just, as an exercise, we can think through it. And I can think of a lot of populations that would get employment opportunities at $5 an hour. You know, if you think about people with significant barriers, significant skill deficiencies, there are employers that have um, roles and responsibilities they would love to take on and like say, you know what, I need someone to get rid of all those dandelions. That was my first job, getting rid of dandelions in front of a bottle redemption center, right? A lot of that becomes is off the table work. And maybe some of that off the table work becomes on the table work. Um, you know, but you know, there. This is where you get into the ugly conversations about voluntary exchange of time for money. But okay. work ethic has to play into that equation as well. Yes, as much as skills and abilities. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Representative Hango. 
I'm not sure I really have a question. Um, I think it's more of an observation that most of this seems to go back to the education of the individual, what skill set they have. And I feel really strongly that maybe putting more monetary restrictions and um, I don't even know what to call it, on a job, um, rather than putting the money into educating the individual to have that skill set is maybe not the best way to go about this. So um, I recall there was a program not long ago in Vermont to retain young people who were skilled in like, the STEM fields. Mm -hmm. So those, those people post-college, whether they came from out of state or they were Vermonters, they intended to reside here. And if they had an education in that background and, and got a job and stayed in that job for a year or 18 months or two years, I can't remember what it was, they got a, a small stipend. But I do recall that it was enough to entice certain young people to stay in the state of Vermont. Um, I know there are a number of different bills and theories about technical education for students, and I think that's a really important thing that can speak to our plumber problem, plumber, electrician, construction worker problem in the state of Vermont. So I just would like the committee and anyone from who are here as witnesses to think about this in maybe just a little bit different different fashion. Thank you. So a couple of quick, more technical things, I guess. Um, if we wanted to ask you, I, I've been under the impression that we could ask you, well, who are tipped employees besides waiters? And it sounds like we can't. It sounds like we don't have that kind of data available to us. Is that accurate, at least on a statewide basis? Um, if you're asking for like uh, research into which occupations typically receive tips, I could provide that as a theoretical. But as far as which employees in Vermont receive tips, I don't know that we have that data. Like if you were saying which individuals in Vermont receive tips, I don't think we would be able to provide that information. But if you're saying but you other can, than waiters, can you waiters, break waiters, down like staff. chambermaids and golf caddies and other? Can you send us a list of people who? who at least based on the Department of Labor, the Federal Department of Labor receives tipped wages. I don't know, I mean, you know, in, I guess I guess it's hard to make policy when you don't have the data to even think about it. And mm -hmm. so it's a little frustrating to know that we don't have weekly data. You know, Washington State might be the only state that has weekly breakdowns of, of who makes what, when, when, and how. Um, hours, too, they have hours. Right, and that's something that is, frustrating to hear that we don't and I'm not I'm just saying that it, it, to, to know that the to know that the information is desired and yet we can't produce it because our antiquated systems or whatever we've not put our priorities into um, is kind of harsh to it, it's just frustrating to hear because mm -hmm. these are all valid arguments and discussions um, but I end up going down a dead end street when there's no data to come back and say, you know, to come back and say, well, let's not talk about waiters. Let's talk about other tipped employees when we talk cab about the tipped Or cab drivers. Oh, are they Lyft drivers? Are they not, you know, I mean, are they 10 Are they employees? Are they subcontractors? Yeah. Like, yeah. So those are the things that we're trying to sort yeah. through. Um, I, not in the, well, in the bill. Um, <laughs> There is, or in the statute, it's not covered in the bill. So in the statute, there is a list of exemptions from the minimum wage. Um, and most of these minimum wage workers that are listed are also not um, eligible for time and a half. So we might be, ta if we have time, we're going to be taking a broader look at some of these some of these broader issues, but agricultural workers are not required to be paid for my minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Any individual in domestic, employed in domestic service, a nanny or a babysitter perhaps, um, or a gardener for that matter. Uh, any individual employed by the United States, that's military, uh, uh, Senator Leahy, uh, in, in, you know, people who actually work for the US government. Um, any individual employed in the activities of a 
public supported nonprofit organization except laundry employees, nurses aides, or practical nurses? Do we know what that means? Um, I don't. Uh, we have to get yeah, legal, counsel. legal counsel from Labor Health. Could you do that? Because yeah. we, our legal counsel can't answer that either. Oh, okay. Oh. Any individual employed in a bona fide executive, administrative, or professional capacity, yeah. um, any individual making home deliveries of newspapers or advertising, taxi cab drivers, outside salespersons, I'm assuming car salesmen could be part of that, or door to door encyclopedia. <laughs> Fuller brush men or women, um, students working during all or any part of the school year, and we'll address, that's addressed in the bill, um, at least in terms of clarifying what a vacation or non vacation means. So, if you could find out that information, because those are going to always, and the other thing that stood out in the statute, you'd be interested to know, I hope, um, it says here that the commissioner and the commissioner's authorized representatives have full power and authority for all of the following. And number five is to recommend a suitable scale of rates for learners, apprentices, and persons with disabilities which may be less than the regular minimum wage rate for experienced workers without disabilities. Sorry, I, can you, <laughs> what is your question? Do, do we know of it or do? Do we know of it? Do we understand the broadness of that? Is that ancient language that should be deleted? Um, is it, is it, I mean, because this particular piece of information taken to the nth degree would allow you to set a student wage above and beyond or uh, whatever we put in the statute. And you, you and whoever's in your seat can say, students, no, you can do this. Um, and I find that very, I mean, I don't know how old that language is um, either. I'm, I'm glad you raised it. I mean, I think it's a great question. I don't. Please don't go back to the office and start no. lowering <laughs> wages for people. <laughs> no, I mean, I agree with you. I think like, wow, like, I mean, who wants? You never knew you had power. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, we think it's, a, we think it's related to places like the Brandon School. Uh, okay. We think, but yeah. we don't know. Um, Did you have a thought? Oh, uh, Jess Vettner with the Department of Labor. I think the only time I've ever referenced that is when we changed and increased the apprenticeship minimum wage this summer. So we have, we have, we have, yeah. we have actually. Yeah. But you can tell people with disabilities that they can make less money. Which I think is against the law, right. the federal. Yeah, I'm like that. Yeah. yeah. I think we There's should. There's a lot of federal sure. conflicts. Okay. So, so we have, we have. Do you, you have that in front of you? Can you just tell us what the? Oh, I thought you, sorry, I thought you had it open. It's fine. Hey, oh, it's right here. Yeah, it's, it's um, it's well, it's Title Twenty One, yeah. of course, and it's Section Three Eighty Five. Okay, thank you. We'll um, we will take. But I would I'd be interested on yeah. on some fairly obviously we're up against the time frame, but a little rapid, rapid turnaround on the nonprofit there, because we're talking about. Minimum wage, people are starting. I mean, this has been happening now. We've been talking about minimum wage for on and off for several years. And so people are starting to see what essentially is a Pandora's box of exceptions. And when nonprofit organizations, when representatives of nonprofit organizations approach me and say, why can nonprofit organizations pay less? I want to say, oh, that's just an old thing. That's not really applicable. Right but it yeah. says right there, public supported nonprofit, that could be conceivably or arguably just about any place. Mm -hmm. And that goes beyond being paid a salary and being asked to ask and being asked to work 80 hours a week. Um, one thing that stood out in some of the testimony that you received, you were making allusions to first jobs, youth, um, but I didn't hear much about the fact that over 50% of the people who receive the minimum wage in the state of Vermont are women. Uh, and, and, a, and a certain percentage of them are uh, uh, single moms or heads of households. So when we talk about equity versus efficiency, the e part of the equity part is the fact that it's not a youth wage. Minimum wage is not a starter wage for a lot of people. And so I just, how do we look at that in terms of the broader picture of saying, 
if I'm a single mom and I have just one kid, how difficult is it to make do on if I'm lucky enough to get 40 hours a week on, on 1079? I'm just yeah, that's a, a great question, and I've, you know I've seen those statistics. Uh, I even brought a couple of them. Uh, you know that get circulated because you know context is everything. So when they're saying you know ninety percent of people who get the minimum wage are not youth, right? Well, the, the worker population for youth is very small. So when you're saying that ten percent of them is youth, that could be like the we're talking about was shifting from a percentage to a number, and so I actually meant to do that calculation just in case the conversation came up, because I've always been interested to see, well, actually, if 10% of minimum wage earners are under 18, but that's basically 90% of everybody who's under 19 is working, well, then actually that kind of does go to the fact that, yes, a lot of jobs are. Um, the other point is, is that we know that that data gets reported out as minimum wage, but that might not be actually their earnings because of tips. So um, to the extent that there are individuals out there, um, which we know, because we work with them all the time, um, you know, the, the, the data is what the data is. So I, I understand that it might disproportionately impact women, which is you know, one of the biggest, uh, I think, failings. And one of the, you know, when we talk about the market, one of the biggest failings that exists out there, which is, is information. It's lack of information about the opportunities available to you. So, some of those professions provide actually benefits that can be real, realized monetarily, which would be short shifts or off-schedule shifts, which can allow an individual to make uh, earnings while you know um, childcare is available for someone. So, other employment opportunities that might be available might not be able to provide the same flexibility. So, there is a host of things that uh, lead to uh, people choosing individual jobs. And we want to make sure everyone's got the best information, make the best decisions about the opportunities out there. Because something that's bugged me the most is that the, there's uh, the, there's still concepts of traditional employment for men and traditional employment for women, and the data continues to just be brick in the wall each year after that. So we are hoping through um, you know more career awareness and exposure to opportunities that we're going to start getting more women into coding which is something that would be able to provide that flexibility in schedule and flexibility in hours. Um, trying to get individuals in those type of opportunities, I think, is ultimately going to benefit everybody and leverage the skills available um, and not saying that you know you have to do this. But to again, so going back to that point I made about minimum wage jobs, it is possible that some of the finest restaurants in Burlington are writing down that their employees are earning minimum wage. And yet, the practical reality is they're making it from sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year as a wait staff. The um, Cavett report, uh, Choice Manchester provided this. This was twenty one point eight percent of the jobs in Vermont are minimum wage jobs. They're considered minimum wage jobs. Is that? Do you work with that number as well? Yeah, um, that looks like the one by 2024 that she's saying. By 2024, it'll impact maybe like 20%. I think uh, Representative Byron and I, we were, I was working initially at the 2020, the 2021 numbers where we were coming up to 10 to 11%. So certainly as it phase all the way up to uh, the $15 by 2024, it'll impact more. Um, that seems to be based on the wage data that I mentioned, which is collected by employers about the occupations they have. So that doesn't seem inconsistent with it. It seems alarming, um, you know, from a market standpoint, um, because I've had those conversations about, you know, economists will be overly reliant and trustworthy on the market. But then, you know, the the counter argument from economists is like, well, what's the alternative, right? We have a bunch of individuals making the best decision for themselves. And the collective of that is market outcomes. And so, you know, someone's coming in and saying, no, one fifth of all jobs in the Vermont economy are not being compensated correctly because somebody says so. Who's to say? And then what are the impacts as it goes forward? Um, because again, you move the cost of labor up, that's going to change the cost of services, everything from housing to construction to taxes. Because I think that's what surprises people the most is we talked a lot about tipped employees, right? Those are the opportunities that seem to get held out as the ones that will be impacted the most. And that's on a percentage basis. Yes, you'll see a lot of people that, um, in like uh, retail service, food and beverage services that are on percentage, those industries will be the impact of the most. But in sheer numbers, where the concentration of these employees are, there's nearly uh, 9,000 people in education. There is nearly 7,000 in social assistance. 
there's about 5,000 in administrative support, 4,000 in nursing and residential. And those are all industries which are, uh, for a large part, funded either in whole or in part by local, state, or federal dollars. And those aren't industries that can pass on cost changes to their consumers and be competitive in the marketplaces. That's strictly coming to the taxpayer's bottom line. Again, going to what is it going to take to do basic needs. So just in sheer numbers, because the size is much bigger than, say, how many people are going to be impacted at gas stations. There's 4,000 people that could be impacted that work at gas stations. There's 9,000 that are going to be impacted in education. Right? Gas stations can pass on their prices. Education are going to pass on their prices in, in forms of uh, their budgets. So do you have a link to um, types of, I mean, I know you have a link to the types of jobs that are in Vermont um, mm -hmm. that you can, um, can you share that with Ron so that we can, um, I mean, I know we can probably find it on the DLL. Yeah, yeah it, yes, um, but, um, are you looking for the, what analyst calls the full smash, all 600 occupations in the state of Vermont, or do you want like a subset, do you want me to cut it by anything? I can, I'll provide a couple of things for those who like data. I'll provide a summary report, and then I'll provide our, you know, our PDF summary summary report. Yeah, just I mean, because we we can go to the tax department and get a list of how many taxpayers pay are paid less than a certain amount of money mm -hmm. as well, and I they'll kind of they're puzzle pieces that kind of fit together, but you know, they're just it's just information we as yeah. much as we can get. Um, Part -time. Yeah, you won't know if these are individuals working full and part time, even though they will have hourly salary versus uh, annual salary. My federal partners, they take it's the program itself derives an hourly number and then it multiplies that number by 28 under the assumption that it's full time work. Um, but we know certain occupations are not full time work, like roofers, they don't work year round. So we don't, at the Department of Labor, we actually we, uh, strike out the annual one. We, do, we don't do that 20 AD calculation because we, uh, we uh, our partners in construction provided us feedback and said that's not helpful. Well, and I think I've seen on your site um, that waiter, or maybe on the national site, that waiters and waitresses average at $15 an hour or something like that. And that's not true in many restaurants mm -hmm. today in Vermont. I mean, it, it may not be in every restaurant, but it's, an average of fifteen dollars an hour, when there are some who are making fifty or sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year, right. is is hard to imagine that um, people are making less than fifteen dollars an hour. But that's average. That's yeah, a statistical average. Yeah, that's it's, it's tough, right? We're looking into a black room, and all we have is little keyholes to try and get a sense of it. And it's in the forefront of my mind because I was just invited and talked to the rural caucus about this topic. That you know, when I talk about employment growth in the state of Vermont, I can say the Vermont economy has grown with a straight face. But you look at where the economic growth has occurred; it's been the Burlington labor market area. Yeah. So, comparing 2007, the last economic peak, to current, a 12-year period of time, Burlington represents something like 120 percent of the employment growth in the state of Vermont. Meaning, everywhere besides the Burlington labor market area has fewer jobs than they did in 2007. And, where we, and again, going back to some of the points the commissioner made, private sector is reporting they're doing less hours. Households are reporting I'm not getting as hours, many hours as I want. And we believe that to be more representative in the rural areas. So again, a concentration. Um, so even that statistic, which shows it's down, is not felt equally by all. So your point about restaurants, there are restaurants where people are not earning $15 an hour. Um, but there are restaurants that can say, you know what, we're going to start charging $15 for a burrito. And in Burlington, you know, their consumers might not blink an eye because of where the economic activity is concentrated right now. Seattle, Washington, you're probably paying $20 for a burrito. I know someone who lives in San Francisco, he makes money hand biking the burritos to people because they will pay for a $25 burrito, you know. But that, those aren't costs that can be borne by all monitors across the state. It's just downtown San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. And he does it for a little bit out of town. It's yeah, the yeah. little bit way out of town. Yeah. Yeah. Former DOL employee. Represented by Ron. I was curious about wage compression mm. with elevating minimum wages. What does that do to people who are already in the scale of the target that? this bill is trying to achieve, what impacts does that have? Yeah. I, mean, I know we don't have a lot of data to mine from. I don't know if the magical honey hole of Washington might have that 
Yeah, no, it's, we're again kind of teetering the economic theory and the reading of the economic tea leaves of what will happen, but wage compression is real. Uh, thinking about the fast food restaurant where someone is getting minimum wage as an entry-level employer and their supervisor is making $12, $12 an hour to deal with all that, right? Um, and then if that person gets a raise, the supervisor is going to say, well, I'm going to need more than a, a five cent differential. You can't give this person 15 and you're going to give me 15.05 to deal with the, mm -hmm. the uh, hoopla or problems that I have to deal with as a supervisor. But I think it goes beyond that even too for small businesses is that this idea that uh, raising the minimum wage, raising the floor will um, somehow lower income inequality as an overall outcome, I think is also a problem because as a small business owner, by raising the wages of your staff, if you're legislatively mandated to do so, you've changed the risk profile of that person who runs the business and that therefore a good business owner is not gonna take on more risk without more return and therefore they are going to in turn raise their own uh, income to themselves as a business owner to compensate themselves for the increased risk. So everybody's got to move up the line because it's got to be based on skills uh, to the extent otherwise there's going to be uh, you know, that potential erosion of the motivation to continue to learn and grow and get skills. Um, my first on the books job was at AMP and I still remember the first time I got my raise at AMP grocery store and you're just like, it was that market signal saying, I must be doing something right, right? Because the person who's hired three months before me is still making minimum wage, yet somehow I got, you know, by the grace of God, 25 cents more. <laughs> so did you work harder after you got that raise? I did. Mm -hmm. I did. Key. Key. Yeah. And I kept growing. And it was a market signal to me even before I knew what market signal. I had the same memories. <laughs> Anything further for the department? Representative Kamosh. I'm curious. When I was growing up, which was many years ago, minimum wage meant one thing. Mm -hmm. And living wage, that we call it now, meant something entirely different. Somehow, those two things have become conflated, in my view, from my experience of or definitions and I'm wondering when you are all gathering statistics, mm -hmm. if that comes into play. Because it seems to me there are two terms that are used interchangeably, mm -hmm. but they have very distinct, different meanings. Mm -hmm. And the one that jumps out to me, for sorry to cut no, off your opinion, but no uh, the one thing that jumps out to me about the greatest difference between the two of them is the basic needs budget or a livable wage is so dependent on household structure and your individual circumstances on where you live and who you live with and how many people you live with and how many dependents you have. Minimum wage is a concept not dependent on how many, you know, and so that is the biggest defining factor, right? You know, uh, what would be constitute a, a basic needs budget for someone who, you know, lives with their parents in the basement is a much different, you know, and their, their con consumption patterns are much different too. Yes. So just one more piece. Going back to the, um, the when you got a raise or, raise or when I got a raise, so <laughs> one thing we haven't spoken about is increased productivity as a result of um, a wage increase. Yes. Now, you touched on it, I touched on it. I remember distinctly when I got a raise, I worked harder mm -hmm. and I was more productive. So how does that play into this whole stuff? That's a great question, too, because I, I look at uh, the behavioral economic research on this as it relates to um, people and money and people and money and happiness. And this is like, there's a lot of interesting research. And if you never looked into it, it's fascinating. They do like, where are they now studies for people who uh, win the lottery? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are in really bad spots, right? Mm -hmm. Just terrible spots. Like, they're just living, you know, you know and of course, those are probably one-off anecdotes. Um, but, you know, as one of our greatest attributes as humans is our ability to adapt. And so, you know, I kind of alluded to it earlier. If you're earning the minimum wage, you know that's the floor. And while initially there will be that, maybe that retention boost, that productivity boost from that, it will wear off because humans have a tendency to adapt to the surroundings they're in and they won't take the, an individual long to realize, wait, I'm still at minimum wage and understand that there's still opportunities and people being compensated uh, above and beyond. And so, you know, the, so I always think about it, there's like two camps, like there's people who benefit from the increase in the minimum wage directly, the people who would be 
uh, directly impacted in negative consequence from the people from the increase in minimum wage. And in each pocket of those camps, there's people down the road as we iterate or play this game or simulate it over and over again that are going to sugar out in different directions. There's going to be people who are going to continue to grow. Those are the skills. The people who have the, the gumption, the fire in the belly, fire to, the belly. to go with the commissioner, <laughs> right? And they are going to go continue marching on. There's going to be people who realize that they got a wage increase and they're just going to be, you know, they, they won't understand how they got there and they're going to kind of slip back into those people that are not employable because they haven't learned the skills necessary to get them that wage and vice versa for the people that are directly impacted negatively from the impact minimum wage. There's going to be people say, I'm on the outside looking in, I need to get in there in the game and then that's how, what those are the populations we're trying to work with is say, you know, those people that say, I'm going to do the work, get the skill acquisition. But I think there will be a short run uh, bump in both retention and productivity. But that would be to be expected, but it would completely level off um, within a matter of time because of it's still the minimum wage. But then uh, there's, there's, of course, other ways of, of maintaining that productivity increase, like increased benefits, another day and a half of vacation a week, or mm -hmm. another week's vacation a year. Yeah. So I mean, there's, there are ways of carrying that forward other than wage incentive that can keep that cycle going, it seems. Yep, I, I would agree. Um, and that's where some of the challenges of um, an increase to the wage is because employers will have to their own self reconcile their own books. And employers think about it as total compensation. They don't think about it as wages. They think about it as wages plus benefits plus all the liabilities I'm associated with for the state and federal government. And so if you're increasing one size of that pool, you're potentially making the other one smaller. Um, those employers, and uh, I know there's even employers in this room that know exactly what you're talking about when it comes to, if I just give a, a, an extra vacation day to my staff, I'm going to have higher retention rates, I'm going to have higher productivity, but that's an elective a local business yeah. does yeah. to make themselves more, uh, yeah. to stand out from their, yeah. their local competition yeah. and um, understand that they, and they'll get the best that way. And that's you know, what the efficiency wage, oh, efficiency wage theory is all about. Yeah. Um, which ultimately does reduce turnover, which does increase productivity um, and helps the bottom line because you're paying above a market rate. Right. But if you move the minimum wage to become the market rate, then you still, again, have to pay above the market rate to realize those benefits in the long term. Representative I'm going to ask a, another abstract question. Uh, so it's sort of related to the, to the um, this notion of like wage compression and the way that if you bump mm -hmm. up the bottom, it's going to move up these others. Yes. And you were talking about um, inequality. And I guess uh, you also had mentioned earlier something about the disparity of information, right? The, access, the disparate access to information gives people competitive advantage in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So let's just say we eliminated all that disparate information. Let's say we got every worker skilled. Where's the friction in the market at that point? In other words, how does anybody how does anybody profit in a system in which everybody is highly skilled and equally skilled? In other words, is moving the skill base an equivalent to moving the wage base? And at which point you create you create a market in which there can't be any friction in differential in information or differential in wage? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then the market doesn't function, right? Because nobody has a competitive advantage over anyone else. So how do you address inequality in a situation like that outside of, say, state intervention, right, with taxation? Um, I guess the, the short answer... Is that answer, too abstract? No, I think the short answer is we'd start eating other states' lunch. But again, right, at some point, I'm just... Now we're talking the complete abstract, right? Like, in order for the... Then that's Vermont as a unit, an economic unit relative to other economic yeah. units. But at some point, if the theory played itself out, right, okay. this idea, this idea that we're going to empower every worker now, every worker is going to have this massive set of skills, mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah, right. Because then now we're getting into a whole discussion of what's the future of labor, and if uh, you know India and China continue to increase their labor force participation rates at the rates they're going, you know, where is the you know where is the labor market going to go from there? Certainly. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how that plays out. I'm hoping that you know some of the predictions from the 1950s will manifest and that we'll become a wealthy enough society that people don't have to work as much. 40 hours just became the, the standard for whatever reason because at least it was lower than 80, you know, which is what everyone was working. So uh, maybe it should be 30. And so therefore, we can start sharing these scarce resources of employment opportunities and actually valuing the, the output of the workers so that we understand that that community engagement, that civil engagement, the social engagements of work are valued as much as the output because I think that ultimately leads to a lot of mental health uh, 
positive mental health outcomes because it removes the isolation, it removes the, uh, the loneliness associated with people who are outside of uh, you know, the current marketplace. Um, and Representative Hango, and I'm going to make this the last question here because Senator Sorokin has joined us. And I don't want to lose him. Um, it's so. not. It's not really a question. It's just a comment on Representative Scott's theory or abstract question. I don't know that really um, that would play out in that manner because not everybody is going to be highly skilled. Mm. We're still going to have the opportunity for people with. <coughs> lower level skills to be working in different industries and then we'll have people with with other more um, more compensatable skills if that's even a word so that's my thought on your abstract so. and these are these examples of the states yeah, you bet yes you bet. Number one got got yeah. and the occupational data you're related to tips is so if i understand the assignment correctly you'd like uh, the number of jobs and then the wage distribution for occupations typically associated with receiving tips okay. and any research you can find on Nonprofit organizations. And specifically nonprofits, or do you just well, there's that you want to that just an, yeah, or an update on the entire statute and just maybe what the exemptions No, are just the I mean just the, 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 the exemptions are pretty clear. It's just that's okay. that well no, I take it. There was back. also the question <laughs> on like the, what is practical nurse. Like it seems like there were a few others that were in that exemption list that we should be looking at as well. Well, just that particular exemption, we don't know what it was for. Okay. okay. But it's implying or at least it's arguable that any nonprofit that's supported publicly or by the public. It's public supported, not publicly supported. Yeah. I mean, I have a feeling, as like I said, it has something to do with the Waterbury State Hospital or Brandon Training Center or someplace like that. But obviously, words matter. And yeah. um, the other part of it, I think, is if you can find out anything more about the age of the language, about being able to determine that people with disabilities can get paid less, or trainees, or learners, or apprentices, whatever the, you know, whatever is in there. Because um, that seems like it's old language. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. I do have to take a I lost my country. Yeah. 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 Considering this a uh, bill introduction from the Senate and just the Senate's point of view on on how you how you approached and did your work on this bill, we have taken testimony from Damien on, on the walkthrough. As you saw, we were just talked to uh, we've talked to Joyce Manchester a little bit. We've also talked to the um, commissioner. So, but but we are very happy to reset and um, hear your your presentation on the bill and what. And how, how you how the Senate worked on it and, and how you came down where you came down. Okay, thank you very much, um, Michael Sorokin, Senator Chipper Kelly. Um, um, so this was uh, you know in some ways hit the replay button for us. Um, we had the bill that passed and we worked on it. We came to agreement and the governor vetoed it. Uh, we didn't see overall much reason to change the bill. One of the choices we had in terms of the cap to $15 was whether to go out six years from where we're starting now, as we did the last time, or go to five, thinking that 
and it was our opinion that the, we thought we were right in what we did, and we didn't think the people should pay the price for the delay. So the difference between last year's bill and this year's bill on minimum wage is a small, uh, uh, slightly larger delta between each year to get to $15 by 2024. Um, overall, we had similar problems as we did in terms of resolving issues around training wages and uh, wage staff, tip wages, and we effectively uh, pushed that off to a study committee. Um, they are complicated issues, uh, and we felt like we didn't want those to, the complications of those issues and the controversies around those issues, we didn't want to drag down the main focus. And they were starting to in our committee. Um, a lot of people were really getting their backs up on those issues and not even paying attention to the, to the basic issue. We had the benefit cliffs issue, which is the, sort of the remaining issue of the bill, which if you recall, um, in 2000 and, um, we're 19 now. In 2017, the legislature passed a study committee, of which your chair and I were co-chair and chair, uh, to study the minimum wage. And I'm sure you either have that report or will get it. That's sort of the Bible, because we touched upon virtually every issue you can think of, and that's summer study. Um, then there was a recommendation from that summer study, and I think we basically implemented that recommendation in 2018, which led to the veto. On, the name of the study was the Minimum Wage and Benefit Cliffs Study. It wasn't just the Minimum Wage Study. So we had to address this issue of what does raising the minimum wage do to low-income people's benefits. And I would say, just as a rule of thumb, and it's not exact, but uh, JFO sort of told us that you can figure for every dollar you give somebody who's at minimum wage to go up in their minimum wage, you, they would lose 50 cents in benefits if you didn't include child care. We did take testimony in public hearings and we asked the pointed question to a lot of people who come before us, does it bother you that you're gonna lose 50 cents in benefits? versus the dollar you get. And everyone said, I wouldn't care if I lost a dollar. I'd rather work and earn that money than, um, uh, than take public assistance. I want control of my own budget. Um, so in certain instances, if a minimum wage worker was also on child care benefits, there was a cliff in that program whereby they would lose Combined with the 50 cents I talked about, they would lose over a dollar. They would be going backwards. So we decided to put in language in our bill last year and this year that said, and we, I don't know how it works here, but basically every dollar we put in our bills gets stripped out by the Appropriations Committee so they can wait till the end and balance the requests we make against all the other requests. But we had a request in there that said, subject to appropriations, we want you to adjust the uh, eligibility level so people uh, don't fall off and also adjust the benefit level so people maintain their benefits, the status quo of benefits in child care. I can't remember what the dollar figure was. If Deb Brighton was the one that crunched all these numbers, and it's actually her idea. She designed this whole thing. It's got a lot of colorful charts. Uh, and we did that again this year. I think it's less of a problem. I, I understand the House has put a lot of money into child care. I assume we will as well. So maybe that, even though we have that provision in there, maybe it's already taken care of by this infusion of funds into child care. Um, I'll stop there. OK, we did hear from Deb Brighton and saw some of her colorful charts, very much a um, truncated version. Um, and part of that was because we didn't have a con we, we were just building our context for the whole bill. Um, no, I, I appreciate I appreciate you filling us in. No, we're not allowed to put dollar figures in into our bills. Um, it's it's severely frowned upon. Yeah. Um, 
but at any rate that but when we do have bills that require some expenditures by the state um, they are clearly going to take a visit next door and spend some quality time there. I would say one other thing on the child care thing. We didn't put a dollar figure in, but we said, subject to appropriations, they should change the program in the ways I described, which equates to a dollar figure. And one thing I didn't describe is we also um, said that they had to uh, raise the um, reimbursements to the child care facilities to make up for the fact that some of their workers are minimum wage workers yeah. and to cover that. Yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the tips portion of it. You, there was in language in there that did last, that did survive from last year about um, owners of restaurants or can't take tips from, that, that the tips belong to the tipped employees. Right. Um, we left that in. I'm not 100% sure according to Damien, that it's as necessary because I think it was a reaction. We followed the House's lead on that because of the timing of the Fed's change and then that got turned back. So we put it in and we left it in, but i um, not sure it does any kind of good at this point. And you created a study committee which um, would, your version would study the, the youth wage question because you did not do last year's version had a whatever the minute whatever the adult minimum wage was less three dollars became the youth wage mm -hmm. um, which kind of matches almost matches what exists today if someone wanted to pay a youth you should also clean up the language about vacations about when when they could be paid right. a lesser wage right. ask for a study the language as I recall in the law it gets kind of confusing. The old language said that, uh, and very few people I think are aware of it, said that um, somebody on vacation from school uh, would be subject to the federal minimum wage, but not the state minimum wage. And there were questions of what does school mean? Does it mean higher ed? Hmm. Or does it just be uh, high school or lower? Um, and what does vacation mean? And so what we came down with was essentially we made it clear that what the um, interpretation that had been given by the Department of Labor was an interpretation that apparently very few people asked about it in practice. Um, that we codified their interpretation was that it only applied to vacations during the school year and not the summer. So during the summer, you would have to get paid the full minimum wage. And that um, it did not apply to higher ed. When we took testimony on that last year, we found very, very, very little information, very few people would either admit to paying someone less than the Vermont minimum wage or basically said it's not, there's no market. You know, there's no, you know, I mean, if, if someone can work and get paid minimum wage at Shaw's, why would they work at Joe's Market for $3 an hour less is, is what. You know, and as you probably start to hear, a lot of people aren't really familiar with all the exceptions right. in the minimum wage. And I think a lot of retail stores don't even know that they could pay a lesser wage for a student. Right. Um, and then the other portion of the study was on the tip minimum wage of the um, figuring out not only the tip minimum wage, but also the inflationary, like how should we approach the minimum wage from an inflation perspective? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I haven't looked at this for a little while. But I think we left as a default. You left the 50 percent. That is left as is the subject of the study. But if you're talking about the inflation factor, going forward after $15, I think it's still at CPI, but it's part of the study. Yeah. So the study could suggest something before that time, something different. There's different yep. measurements. You know, some states, I think California has, has been silent on theirs. They don't even say what happens after that. So. Yeah. Did you receive any testimony on the, um, so on the CCFA, CCFAP, issue, the child care issue, um, 
Did you receive any similar testimony from any of the other organizations that rely on federal or state funds that are capped at a certain level that are wary of paying people more or that, that would be put into, you know, like the, the home health care or anybody else? Did any? Did you get testimony from them as well? Yeah, uh, from the home health agencies and some nursing homes said, you know, we're really significantly at the mercy of the state reimbursement rate and this is going to be hard on us. We didn't feel that, I, mean, we, I guess we didn't feel that it was going to be hard on them for the next couple, of, they could do it for the next couple of years. In two more years from now, if there's no adjustments to some of their wages. On the other hand, I was totally shocked by their turnover rates, 40%. Yeah. I said, don't you get something back if you pay people a little bit more in terms of a lesser turnover rate? So, uh, we received testimony on the paid family leave that there was an organization, a uh, commercial organization, that spent 1.2, so 1.2 million, million dollars on training. 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 Yeah, because they are a high turnover <laughs> trade. Right, that was another thing. Uh, yeah, really high expenses for, for yeah. training. Okay, now we're uh, Representative Hango. Um, can you tell me why you felt, or your committee felt, that um, home health agencies and nursing homes could sustain two years of increases? Because we got feedback that where they were starting their people now was at least, like, they had a, a real couple stepped up basis very quickly. They started one thing and 30 cents more. I mean, 30 days later they go to another, and 60 days later. And they were paying there was a differential that they're paying now to the existing minimum wage. They weren't paying right at the minimum wage now. So there was a room there, you know, but over time it was going to be more of a hardship. Mm -hmm. um, Senator, the, the, ex, the exempted classes of people, which aren't, could a study be done with them as well? Because it, it just seems, when I look at that, like for, I want to understand why farm workers and others People just with why they've been exempted historically, and should they now? Is that just so old in our statute that we need to revisit it, or why? Why did the committee decide not to take a look at the exemption classes in this study? I, I, I actually don't think. I mean, there may have been a, a lobbyist somewhere along the line that approached me about that, but nobody raised the issue. It's not that. We didn't say no, though I probably would have said no, because, uh, you know, it's just this is controversial enough as it is, and it affects, you know, you know probably 95% or more of the people are going to be focused, well, maybe if you include the tipped wages, it would be less, but uh, most people are going to be affected by raising the minimum wage. I'm not saying it shouldn't be looked at again. We didn't hear any testimony on it. It could be the subject of another bill. Certainly, if you guys want to look at it, we'll look at it if you said something to us. But, uh, you know, it's part of the right. of this building. Sure. I'm sorry, I might have misunderstood what you just said, but you didn't take any testimony on farm wages for this so. in relation to this bill. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Anything that shuts my recollection, anyhow. Right. No, I remember right. somebody talking to me about it and asking me, but I don't think it was a formal testimony. No, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole question of some of the language in, in the bill. I mean, traditionally we've approached the wage portion of it and not really paid any attention to the rest of the bill. And the rest of the bill, I think more people are starting to focus on the farm workers or the taxi cab or the newsboys. Um, right. You know, and, and you know, the fact that there's wage orders in here, wage board, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's one of those things where it's the other elements of the statute are seeping into a conversation that have to be dealt with perhaps at some point. Um, but I think the, I mean, I think the key portion of the bill so far is the rate change, which you just said you just, you just kept the same date as last year and just shrunk the, um, what did you say? What was the phrase you used? The, 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 the increases each yeah, year, yeah, the yeah. delta? The delta, right. And then um, 
and then the tip of course. So, so there's elements of this that are pretty solid, I think. And yeah. it's just because, very similar to last year's one. Yeah, which if you look at us, Tommy and I were the only ones on the right. committee you last year. I here that I couldn't just assume that everybody was familiar. Yeah, and that's right. something that's that's of course the world that we live in. You know, every a lot a lot of things change. Right. You know, in, in the makeup of the committee. So. It, I can't say that this committee was so gung-ho on it last year that it matters this year. You know, we have to learn. We have to go through the same process that you just went through. I think the, you know, I don't know if you consider the, the Delta doing in five years or six as a big issue, but the biggest change, I'd say, was just adding the students into the study. Other than that, it's pretty similar to last year's. Yeah. Well, thank you for getting us started on this bill. Okay. Um, Good luck. And then we will reset, and next week we're going to have invite many of the same witnesses that you brought in and, um, and have at it. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.